The D.C., Maryland, North Virginia area, colloquially known as the DMV to locals, is considered among the best places to live, work, and raise a family in the country. With its high-paying jobs in D.C. and the surrounding areas, sprawling suburbs, and relatively low crime rates with a high standard of living, it's no wonder that so many people call the DMV area home. While the millions of people that live in this area carried on their daily lives, they were oblivious that the idyllic nature of what they once knew would come crashing down in early October 2002. On October 2, 2002, the residents of the DMV would forever be changed, and the nation was captivated by a seemingly murderous madman who was going around and killing people at random. Men and women were targeted. People of all races, beliefs, and socioeconomic statuses were targeted. The killer or killers simply did not care who they hurt. To the public and the nation as a whole, it appeared that the killer that would eventually become known as the DC sniper in the newspapers would go on killing indefinitely. To say that there was no panic was an understatement. Not helping the situation further was that so few clues were found and with so much paranoia, the few reliable clues police had were lost in the chaos. In the words of one officer leading the case, the DC sniper was simply a ghost with a gun. But how would police catch this ghost? How would these cases ever get solved when the sniper was thought to be traveling the entire United States? For DMV residents, their horror started in the evening of October 2, 2002. At around 5.20 that evening, the Michaels Arts and Crafts store in Aspen Hill, Maryland was quiet and normal. The store was almost empty, and after the cashier on duty that day had just finished ringing up a customer, a loud pop echoed throughout the store. At first, thinking it was a light bulb that had burst, the employee began searching for which bulb had popped. To her horror, she soon realized that a light bulb had not exploded in its socket. Rather, a gunshot had been fired at her. In the front window, a tiny hole protruded through it that had not been there before. Looking just to the right above her head, the electronic sign indicating lane number 5 was smashed to pieces by a bullet. That bullet would later be recovered in the back wall of the store. While she may have been lucky, the sniper's first victim, James Martin, would not be so fortunate. About two miles away at a local grocery store called the Shopper's Food Warehouse, 55-year-old James Martin was doing some grocery shopping to prepare some food for the youth group at his son's church. The devoted father, Boy Scout leader, volunteer, and Civil War buff was walking into the store when the evening was punctuated once more by a gunshot. Without any warning, a bullet entered his back, severed his spinal cord, and destroyed his internal organs. A witness saw James get shot and called for police. By the time they got there, it was too late. James Martin was dead and there was nothing that anyone could do to save him. For Montgomery County, Maryland police, this homicide was strange. The area rarely saw homicides, and stranger homicides were particularly rare. Combined with the random shooting at the Michaels not more than an hour before, one of the responding detectives wondered if there was a sniper on the loose. It would not take more than 24 hours before this theory was not only widely accepted by various police agencies in the DMV, but would be broadcast to the public to make them aware that indeed, a serial killer was on the loose. While Martin's murder may have been strange, it was the following day that truly saw the DMV area sent into a world of despair and panic. Early that morning, James Buchanan rose that day to help out some clients of his. He'd worked as the manager for his family's landscaping business, but had given up that after moving away to help tend to his father's farm. Whenever James was back in Maryland, he liked to volunteer some of his time to mow old clients' grass as a way to say thank you for the years of continued patronage they had given his family business. For this reason, he found himself mowing the grass of the Fitzgerald Auto Malls that fateful morning. Soon after starting his mower, James was going up a hill when a shot rang out. He immediately clasped his chest and let his mower continue aimlessly as he ran to go inside the shop for help. He only made it about 50 yards before collapsing in front of the parking lot of the store. 
Passersby called 911 and told operators that a man had been severely injured in a freak lawnmower accident. James was still alive when EMTs took him to the hospital, but he soon passed away from massive blood loss. At the hospital, responding surgeons were perplexed at his injuries. He had a small hole in the front of his chest and another hole in his back. To these experienced doctors, James had not suffered a freak accident. He had been shot. Unfortunately, this revelation would not make it to the police since not even 30 minutes later, 54-year-old Indian immigrant Prem Walakar was filling up his taxi with gas before starting his workday. After leaving the gas station, Walakar was shot in the chest and he immediately fell to the ground after telling someone to call an ambulance. Within minutes, medical services arrived and while they were performing CPR on him, he was not responding to it. Within 20 minutes, they were told to stop life-saving efforts and move to another nearby scene because a call came in that a woman had just shot herself on a bench in a nearby shopping plaza. When police arrived at the scene, they found 34-year-old mother Sarah Ramos dead from a gunshot wound. She'd been sitting on a bench in the shopping center not far from the gas station Wallacher had been murdered at. The book she had been reading while waiting for the bus to go to her cleaning job was covered in blood. The bullet had passed through her and into another store window where thankfully no one had been hurt. While police were attending to this scene, about 90 minutes later at 9.58 a.m. in nearby Kensington, Maryland, 25-year-old Lorianne Lewis Rivera was vacuuming out her van at a Shell gas station. Everything seemed normal until yet another gunshot broke through the morning air. Employees and patrons at the gas station thought that the sound might have been that of an airbag accidentally deploying or a tire bursting. To their horror, they found the woman lying in a pool of blood. Within minutes, she was on her way to the same hospital that James Buchanan had been treated. But like him, she too passed away from massive blood loss before doctors could save her life. With five homicides in less than 24 hours, with four of them being within three hours, the police chief of Montgomery County held a press conference at 11.18 that morning. By this time, police had pieced together that the detective's theory from the previous day was correct and that there was indeed a serial sniper on the loose. At this first conference, Chief Moose urged calm, ensuring the public that everything was under control and not to panic. However, he knew that to be a lie, since when he made those statements, police had absolutely no idea where to even begin with this massive investigation. That was until they interviewed a witness from the Ramos murder scene at the mall in Norbeck, Maryland. 20-year-old Juan Carlos Villeda was a landscaper and had been working in the parking lot of the mall where Ramos had been shot. According to him, as soon as he heard the gunshot, he saw a white van or box truck speed away from the scene. He was unsure if the van had any kind of lettering or logo on it. He also was not sure if there was any kind of tools or ladders hanging off of it like one would expect a work-type vehicle to have. He also could not give any description of the driver. Despite how scant his information was, the elusive white van or box truck would become a centerpiece of the DC sniper investigation almost until the very end. Even though it was not much to go on, it was the only thing they had. And immediately, police around the capital region started searching every white van and box truck they could find. Unfortunately for police, in Montgomery County alone, there were over 70,000 such vehicles. The random nature of the roadblocks and traffic stops would do nothing but waste valuable officer time. However, with public fears already growing, they were forced to do something to show that they were making progress towards catching the killer or killers. However, these efforts proved fruitless since, before the end of the day, the sniper would strike once more, this time expanding his killing fields. In D.C. that evening, 72-year-old Haitian immigrant Pascal Charlot was taking a stroll on Georgia Avenue near his home. The retired carpenter and father of five liked to take walks when the weather was nice. During this time of year, the cool evening air was the right time for him to take a stroll and get some fresh air. But for Pascal, that fresh air would be his last since, at 9.15 that evening, he became the fifth victim of the D.C. sniper that day. Pascal fell to the ground as passersby called the police. 
People were already aware that the DC sniper was on the loose and started looking for any white-colored box trucks or vans. However, the only vehicle they saw, a dark-colored sedan with tinted windows and no headlights, slowly pulled away into a side alley. This eyewitness report made it onto police radio traffic. A Prince George's County, Maryland trooper saw a vehicle he thought could have matched the description of the vehicle identified during the shooting. He ran the license plate number on the blue Chevrolet Caprice. The New Jersey license plate number NDA21Z did not come back as stolen or missing, so he continued on his way to work while the car continued along the highway into Virginia. Little did that trooper know that he was the first of nine separate encounters that the DC sniper would have with law enforcement until his eventual downfall. While local, state, and federal authorities set up a command center to filter in the thousands of tips they'd already started receiving, police in Maryland wanted to confirm forensically that the cases were, in fact, linked. All of the first six victims were autopsied at the same time at the University of Maryland campus in Baltimore. The examination team, led by the state's chief medical officer, wanted to conclusively prove that all these cases were related so that police could focus their efforts. After x-raying each of the bodies, the medical examination team found something shocking. Because lead itself does not typically show up on x-rays, the fact that the inside of each victim had what medical examiners called a snow pattern was startling. Full metal jacketed bullets do not tend to show a snow pattern because they have so much energy they normally punch right through human tissue. Hollow point bullets are meant to expand on impact to cause maximum damage. When these bullets expand, the metal casing breaks apart. It's this metal casing that shows up in the x-rays as the snow pattern seen in a lot of gunshot victims. The fact that the sniper used hollow point bullets proved that the intention was to kill using the most effective means of doing so. The medical team then extracted the bullet fragments and sent them to the ATF lab in DC. Here, Analysts confirm that bullet fragments recovered from each victim were that coming from a .223 caliber rifle. These rifles are modeled after the standard U.S. military issue M16 rifles and M4 carbines. But while the medical examiners were conducting their work in Baltimore, in a shopping center in the sleeping northern Virginia town of Fredericksburg, the DC sniper struck again. Homemaker and wife Carolyn Sewell was packing her car full of recent Halloween purchases she'd just made at the Michael's Arts and Crafts store in the Spotsylvania shopping center. As she was loading her car, she heard a gunshot. At that exact moment, she said a quick prayer asking God to let her live. In the next instant, she only felt pain as the bullet tore through her back, her abdomen, and her van. Police arrived in minutes. Undenounced responding officers, surveillance cameras would capture the sniper's 1990 Caprice. But at the moment, the only thing that mattered was helping Carolyn survive her injuries. Even as she was shepherded to the hospital, FBI and ATF agents were on scene to process it. They quickly recovered the bullet from her van and immediately had it flown by helicopter to the lab to have it compared with the other bullets from the known sniper victims. It was a match. What was most shocking about this case was that the sniper was now operating far beyond the immediate DMV area. Fredericksburg is considered by most locals to be the limit of what's considered Northern Virginia. The fact that the sniper was hunting here now meant that even more millions of people were at risk than those that lived inside D.C. and the immediate areas. Despite the setback that the sniper was now hunting in new territory, the police did have a major victory. Now that the police could conclusively prove that all these cases were factually related, their next move was to start gathering clues to find the killers. Fortunately for police, that weekend did not see any more shootings, but police did not sit on their hands. While patrol officers continued to interview witnesses and stop suspect vehicles, officers manning the telephone lines continued to field thousands of calls that came into police headquarters. Throughout the course of the investigation, over 100,000 individual tips would be called in. Each call would have to be written down on a call form for as much information as possible. Even the most insignificant details, like the time of day, the caller's tone, and many other facts, were catalogued. 
These sheets were then entered into an FBI software program that uses mathematical algorithms to classify leads and help investigators determine where to go. Even though call after call came in, no amount of tips or stopped white vans could prevent the next shooting that occurred on Monday, October 7th. Bowie, Maryland is a suburb in central Maryland about 30 minutes away from the heart of D.C. On that fateful morning, students at Benjamin Tasker Middle School were getting a head start on their school day that normally started at 8.30. 13-year-old Ian Brown was getting taken to school that morning by his aunt like he normally did. After dropping him off and wishing him a good day, his aunt had not even driven off yet when a gunshot rang out. Ian instantly collapsed. However, the young man was stronger than the bullet that hit him and was soon on his feet running towards his aunt's car. She shepherded him inside and knew he was in trouble. His white hoodie was covered in blood pouring out of his chest. As a trauma nurse herself, she knew time was of the essence. As she sped away, she called 911, all while making a beeline towards the nearest hospital. However, the closest hospital was not a trauma center, and after stabilizing Ian... He was life-flighted to Washington, D.C., where doctors were able to save him. As all of this was happening, the federal, state, and local police response was strong as always. It was sad that the police had their massive response almost down to a science now, but that would be the reality for the foreseeable future. Among the massive police response was a class of Montgomery County police cadets. These cadets were tasked with combing the forested areas near the school for any scraps of evidence they could find. Not long after commencing their search, the cadets found a depressed area of foliage about 150 yards from the school. In the depression, they located a spent .223 shell casing and a blue pen. Not long after that, a cadet noticed what looked like a playing card. When they picked it up, they found that it was not a playing card, but a fortune-telling tarot card. This particular card was the one for death and had a note written on it. It said... Hey, Mr. Police, call me God. Do not share this with the press. It was the first time during this crime spree that the sniper had communicated with police. According to expert testimony later on, the sniper decided to use the phrase, Call me God, as an identifier so that the police could authenticate who he was whenever he called in. Wanting to honor the sniper's wishes, Chief Moose, who had become the scene commander for this investigation, decided not to release this information to the press. Unfortunately for him, within 24 hours, the Washington Post and several other newspapers found out and ran the story as saying the tarot card had I am God scribbled on it. The inadvertent press leak definitely hurt the investigation. Not only did police have enough work on their hands with the copious quantity of actual tips that poured in, but now they had to worry about imposters, pranksters, and psychics calling into police hotlines. All of these calls still had to be monitored, recorded, and input into their software database, which cost precious man hours and time. In the words of Chief Moose, the press release definitely slowed the investigation down tremendously. In fact, the killers themselves would even admit that the tremendous amount of calls clogging the police lines angered them and would have deadly consequences for more innocent victims. But for the citizens of the DMV, the killings would continue despite the outpouring of support from both the public and law enforcement agencies across the country. On the evening of October 9th, Vietnam veteran Dean Myers was making his way home from his office in Manassas, Virginia. He stopped off of I-95 shortly after leaving work to fill up his gas tank. As he was pumping gas, yet another shot rang out, and he fell to the ground, dead. Even before he could be whisked away to the hospital, police had swarmed the area like they normally did. However, it was here that another officer would have a chance encounter with real snipers. As officers were questioning everyone at the local restaurant before they left, the sniper in his 1990 Blue Caprice approached the officers. When asked if he saw or heard anything, the man responded that he'd been on vacation in the area and was just returning home. The man seemed calm and confident. With nothing tying that New Jersey license plate to anything nefarious, the sniper slipped through the police's fingers once again. Once the killers had escaped, it would not be long before they struck again. Just two days later, on the morning of October 9th, 
Kenneth Bridges was on his way to work when he stopped off I-95 to get some gas just out of Manassas. Like before, a shot rang out, and he fell to the ground, dead. Despite the intense police response, little evidence was recovered, and no eyewitnesses had anything noteworthy to report. The lack of evidence certainly frustrated police. In a conference of police representatives from across the nation, Chief Moose brainstormed ideas. The one came up at the time that would seem useful. Why it was never followed through remains a mystery. The blue caprice that had been spotted leaving the scene of Pascal's DC murder on October 3rd had never been followed through. Despite this claim, police remained laser-focused on the elusive van. That unfruitful search would cause a delay that would lead to yet another life being taken. On the evening of October 14th, FBI analyst Linda Franklin and her husband were shopping at the Home Depot at the Seven Corners Mall in Falls Church, Virginia. Linda held a flashlight while her husband loaded the things they had purchased into the trunk of their car. Unknown to them, the DC sniper was hiding in wait. As one of the suspect's testimony would later clarify, they had first targeted her husband. However, with his head continuing to bob and weave as he loaded their purchases into their car, the killer decided to shoot Linda instead who was standing still. Just like before, a shot rang out and shattered the evening calm. Linda died instantly from a gunshot wound to her head, and the blue caprice slipped away before police even got to the scene. After Linda Franklin's murder, police continued to scratch their heads at what evidence they really had. Beyond the reports of the white van and blue caprice from two of the murders, the ballistic evidence recovered from the victims, and the tarot cards there was little else to go on, or so the police thought. Because of the high volume of calls, tons of relevant tips were intermixed with imposters and lunatics claiming to be the killer. However, on the afternoon of October 15th, Officer Derek Balalez picked up the phone to answer yet another tip. Instead of this time being another concerned citizen, it was a gruff and angry voice. The man told the officer to shut up and listen. He claimed that he was one of the people killing all the citizens during the attacks. He demanded to know why their previous attempts at communication were not taken seriously. As the officer tried to explain their situation, the caller hung up. While not sure if this was indeed the DC sniper, the officer forwarded the recording to the DC sniper task force for future action. However, due to the huge volume of calls and tips, the task force would not get the tip in time. It was not until another murder happened that really focused the police on who the killer or killers might be. On the evening of October 19th, Jeffrey Hopper and his family were famished after a long road trip from Florida to Pennsylvania to visit a sick relative. Wanting to get a bite to eat before continuing their drive, the family pulled off on I-95 near Ashland, Virginia and onto Route 54. Here they had several restaurants to choose from, but they chose a local steakhouse known as Ponderosa Steakhouse. After enjoying a meal with his family, Jeffrey was walking back to their car when the DC sniper struck again. The sniper's bullet ripped through his abdomen, and he instantly knew he'd been hit. As he clasped his hands to his stomach, he fell to the ground in the worst pain he'd ever experienced. Fortunately for him, He'd survive his injuries after numerous extensive surgeries and about a month in the hospital. As per protocol, federal and local law enforcement blanketed the area looking for clues. This time, they found something that would blow the case wide open. After finding the likely sniper perch tucked away in some brush about 30 feet from the parking lot, investigators recovered a spent 223 shell casing. However, this time, there was something else. Nailed to a tree by the hiding spot was a plastic Ziploc bag with numerous sheets of pink paper folded like a letter. Not wanting to disturb any DNA or fingerprint evidence, officers on the scene did not touch the letter until evidence collection technicians carefully removed it and sent it off for analysis. While no physical evidence was recovered from the letter, its contents were shocking. Addressing the police as Mr. Police again and using the call sign, Call Me God, the letter was in essence both a ransom note and a complaint against the police. For the ransom, the DC sniper said he wanted $10 million sent to a specific Bank of America account. He wanted a new bank card issued where he could withdraw unlimited funds around the world. 
the letter also berated the police for not listening to their previous calls. In the letter, the sniper listed four separate incidences where the killers had called police but had not been taken seriously. When police went back and reviewed those calls, the details contained within them blew the case wide open. In one of the calls, the supposed sniper related to the officer to contact a local Maryland detective who'd been working a robbery and homicide about a month before. The details listed by the caller matched, and the unsolved homicide involved a high-caliber rifle like the killer was using in the attacks now. The same call also referenced a robbery and homicide in Huntsville, Alabama at a liquor store. The caller claimed the police there would know who they were. Once officers had analyzed all the calls, they immediately started working with Huntsville police to see if they could identify the killer in that case. A fingerprint recovered from an expended pistol magazine matched a fingerprint recovered from the blue pen at the middle school shooting in Bowie, Maryland. Police then ran the fingerprints through the National Fingerprint Database and came up with a hit. The fingerprints belonged to a young man named Lee Malvo. Malvo's fingerprints were on file with federal police since he and his mother had been arrested in the Tacoma, Washington area for unrelated offenses. When responding officers ran their information, they came up as undocumented migrants and were then sent off for deportation proceedings. How Malvo ended up in Washington state, and now the nation's capital as a homicide suspect in the country's most infamous killing spree, is a whole different story in and of itself. Malvo was born in poverty in Jamaica. When his parents split when he was a young boy, his mother moved from island to island in the Caribbean in search of work. It was not until they came to the island of Antigua that they ran into John Allen Mohammed and his children. During this time, Mohammed was on the run from his estranged wife and their children. A 16-year U.S. Army veteran, the abusive husband fled Washington State after his soon-to-be ex-wife filed for divorce and custody of their three children. After fleeing to several U.S. locales, the deadbeat dad fled the country to Antigua. He ran into Malvo and his mum when they came to him as customers for his fake U.S. passport and document scam he'd been running. After selling the pair a set of fake documents to get them to Florida, the pair continued communicating upon Mohammed's return to Washington State a few months later. Why Malvo and Mohammed had such a strong bond is a point of debate, and Mohammed claimed that he cared for Malvo like a son, while others said they had a consensual homosexual relationship. Either way, the pair could not be separated by distance, and one fateful day, Malvo left home in Florida to be with Mohammed as the father figure he never had. Once in Washington State, the duo was always at each other's hips. It was during this time that many believe Mohammed started brainwashing Malvo to do his bidding. Because Mohammed was a coward, he could not harm his wife or her friends himself. When she eventually won custody of their children after their divorce had been finalized, this sent him over the edge on his path to murder. Beginning in Washington State with one of his wife's friends who had convinced her to get a divorce, the pair spent the next six months traversing the U.S. by bus and committing murders and robberies as their source of income. In attacks throughout the U.S., the pair killed seven people and wounded another seven. The initial motive for these attacks was to build up enough cash reserves and equipment for the real motive behind their operation. While Mohammed had stayed behind in Washington State, his ex-wife and their children relocated to the D.C. area. It was for this reason that Mohammed decided to start his mass killing. In his twisted mind, if the pair killed his ex-wife as part of serial mass murder, he would not be suspected. Once he'd settled on this course of action, it was a matter of time once they'd gotten enough money robbing and killing to really begin getting to work on setting his plan into motion. But for police, even though the connection of Malvo had been firmly established by fingerprint evidence, his relationship with Mohammed was still unknown. It would not be until one of Mohammed's close friends filled in the gaps for officers. As the DC sniper rampage was going on, one of Mohammed's best friends, Robert Holmes, saw the killings and thought that Mohammed could be behind them. To Holmes, it all made perfect sense. He knew Mohammed hated his ex wife with his whole being. He also knew that his son, Malvo, would follow his every command. Holmes also thought it strange that ever since leaving his home a few months ago, where they'd been staying, he'd not heard from or seen them since. 
Holmes also thought it strange that Mohammed also referred to Malvo by his nickname of Sniper, and that the two of them regularly practiced shooting an AR-15 style rifle in his backyard. While it took several days after this realization for Holmes to call the police, it would be several more days until FBI agents from Seattle sat down with him. Convinced of the possible link and with nothing else to go on, the FBI recovered evidence from Holmes' backyard, including the stump that the two practiced shooting on. Ballistics testing would soon confirm that the shell casings recovered from the backyard and bullets lodged inside the stump matched the ballistic evidence from the DC sniper crime scenes. The hunt was now on for John Mohammed and Lee Malvo. But while investigators across the country were helping tie together the case, the sniper reneged on a previously made demand. In the Ponderosa letter, the killers stated that they wanted their money by Monday morning and that they would call a specific payphone. However, this never happened for unknown reasons, despite police manning the numbers the killers listed. What did happen was that police recovered another ransom demand via telephone. The killers only spoke for 38 seconds, and the recording was pre-recorded. Most of the speech was difficult to make out, but the killers clearly stated they wanted Chief Moose to say that they had the killers caught like a duck in a noose. When police traced the call and responded to the Richmond, Virginia payphone, they did not find the killers. Instead, they found two undocumented migrant workers who had also been using the payphone at the same time the killers had, and this had caused the wiretap to think it was them. With this false alarm settled, the DC Sniper Task Force wondered when they would strike next, since their only way of communicating with them now was through the media. It would not be long. In the early morning hours of October 22nd, bus driver Conrad Johnson was preparing to start his morning route around 5.35 a.m. But for him, his route would never start, since when he went to open his bus doors, a shot rang out from a nearby basketball court. The in-training driver with him heard and witnessed the shooters kill Conrad. After ducking for cover, he immediately called the police and they soon descended on the scene. Once they'd recovered a shell casing, they also found a glove and another note in a Ziploc bag. Unlike before, this note was a single page and was a repeat of the earlier Ponderosa ransom note, along with more threats against the public and children in particular. Despite the repeat of the earlier ransom threats, the police knew that they were closing in on their suspects. After linking Mohammed to the 1990 Caprice that he had purchased in New Jersey, soon their information was put all across every television network imaginable. One motorist by the name of Whitney Donahue would be the hero to bring the duo down. On the evening of October 23rd, Whitney was on his way back home to Pennsylvania after a long day's work. As he was driving home, he decided to stop at a rest stop near Frederick, Maryland to grab a quick hour nap before getting back on the road. As he pulled into the parking lot, two other cars were present. Upon closer inspection, one of them was the blue caprice mentioned on the radio. While listening to that broadcast, he had the wherewithal to write down the license plate number in case he ever needed it. When he checked it, they matched. As soon as he realized this, he called the police. After advising him not to let the killers out of his sight, a trucker pulled into the parking lot and police had him block the entrance. Soon after this call, every available officer in Maryland was on their way to assist. But for police, they did not know if the duo were even there. Even though they'd positively identified their car, the police had not seen any movement. Perhaps they'd abandoned the car or were lying in ambush should police approach. Not wanting to take any chances, the police assembled an assault team composed of a Montgomery County SWAT team and an FBI hostage rescue team. After briefing their plan and rehearsing in a nearby McDonald's parking lot, the team commenced their assault at 3.30 in the morning of October 24th. With guns drawn, the officers approached the car from the cover of the woods. In less than a minute, they'd broken its windows and seized whomever was inside. Malvo had been sleeping in the front seat while Mohammed was sprawled along the back seat. Neither offered any resistance. With the two suspects in custody, the nation, and especially the police, breathed a sigh of relief. Unfortunately for the snipers, the car offered everything police needed to convict them despite their initial denials. The rifle itself, a makeshift sniper's nest in the trunk, a laptop with detailed notes on targets and escape routes, 
and a GPS transponder all meant that even if neither suspect talked, they would not need a confession. In the coming months and years, trials in Maryland and Virginia were held for both killers. Both were convicted of each D.C. sniper murder, with Mohammed being sentenced to death and Malvo to life in prison. Mohammed would eventually be executed in Virginia in 2009 for his role in masterminding the murders, while Malvo continues to serve life in prison without parole. Thank you.